Okay, hi everyone. So um, the title of the, the presentation is um, A Journey in Human-Centric Design Integration in the 3D VR Space. Sounds like a mouthful. And it's looking particularly at this project that Dan's just told you about, the Kocha uh, Biofiltration Plant, and how we experience that in this, in this particular project. And to be honest, it's something of a personal journey to me, so I'm sharing some things from a personal perspective. Um, it's not a study of how we got everything right. In fact, quite a few of these things we learned the hard way. And, um, and I particularly think we were sometimes a bit slow to learn the things. Um, and this, this results in frustration for team members, but it's been a growing process along the way. And part of my journey is learning to work with the wonderful people that we work with every day and learning to do that better. So that's, that's a, a very special aspect of my, my job every day. Um, and we're going to start off talking about art. And why I ended up with this is because that I believe that we are fashioned to appreciate beauty and even to long for it. And we're not just practical beings. We need a little bit of color. So what do a pair of boots have to do with the design of a treatment plant, water or wastewater? I'm glad you asked. So this is the Binnenhof complex in The Hague. That building, building was built, the first part of it, in the 1300s, and it was originally a residence for Dutch uh, counts. And it eventually became their political center, and it's now the oldest um, house of parliament in the world today. It's been used as that since the 1500s. So for almost 500 years, it has been in that function. And if you go and look at the buildings around The Hague, you'll get many, many beautiful buildings like this. So when Vincent van Gogh, the famous painter you may know, was asked to paint a series of cityscapes of The Hague, he was spoiled for choice. It's really, really stunning scenery that you get there. So what did he paint? He painted backyards. This one focused on the common place and the common man and the common work, uh, common woman busy at work. And if you notice there, you'll see the articles of industry. There's a laundry in the foreground and the ladies working there. At the back, there's a timber yard. You'll see all the timber frames. Outside, on the right-hand side, you see a guy pruning or cutting trees. There's a wheelbarrow in the foreground all reflecting life's order, work, labor. And then in the foreground, a blooming tree, which becomes a symbol of life and hope. This one, Van Gogh, captivated the hardship and the trial, and yet the meaning of the common man and woman at work. This is his famous one called the sower. And it you, you see with the, the colors and the light and the feeling that it, con it conveys, it synthesizes life's hard work and gives a kind of a spiritual and eternal meaning to life. Here's another. This is titled Two Women in the Moor. This is at the end of the day at twilight. And you see those two figures stooped in the twilight with that, with that, that band of twilight crossing, crossing across the horizon as they perform, perform their their burdensome duty. But he's done that intentionally. He's trying to show the link between hard work and heaven and to link those two together. It's a kind of a transitional period of night and day shows the symbolic meaning of eternity and, and the eternal meaning of work and how important it is. So that brings us back to the boots. So have a look at those boots. They're well worn. They've been used. They've been used in hard labor, showing dedication. And they're unlaced, like they've been kicked off at the end of a tiring day. So again, what have they got to do with the design of a water treatment plant? Well, if you told me you've got the key to a successful project, 
a successful, in my context, treatment plant uh, project, I would be all ears because I know that's going to keep me out of trouble. It's going to keep us away from risk, from professional claims, from problems in the operation and commissioning, and all the things that often face us in an engineering project. So my thought is that there is such a key and that the key is a person or persons and it's the operator. So some of you might have heard me talk about uh, Professor Apia Amirtharajira. So if you've studied a lot of the work written in the 80s and 90s, papers and textbooks, you'll come across him. And I had the fortune of listening to him uh, for a week. And one of the things that stood with me that he said there is you can have a fantastically designed plant, but if you have a poor operator, he's going to sink it. But you can have a badly designed plant and a good operator, and he'll make it look good. So the question we asked ourselves in this project and ask ourselves over and over, and that I like to encourage us to do, is what are we doing to give the operator every chance of success? For him, and to make sure that our project will work. How can we enhance the experience and interaction of the operators with their plant? So an example is I've often been into plants in remote areas and you go into the plant and there's things that are not working properly, but you can't find the operators. They're tucked away in some little remote nook or cranny in not very nice conditions. And the people will be very quick to complain that the operators are not operating the plant well. But how well did they design the plant to integrate those operators and enhance their experience? So if you need something to be under regular supervision, have you designed the plant so that area is accessible or even constantly under eye? So going back to those boots, the operator is the person who wears those boots. And they wear them shift in, shift out. They're there on Christmas Eve and Easter and cold winter's nights. And the wearer of those boots is critical to the success of our projects. So the design challenge we face ourselves with is how do we identify areas and equipment that we want under eye, under the eye of the wearer of those boots? And can we imagine and design a monitoring and sampling route and and all the, the, the daily routines and habits that they need to be involved in and configure the plant around that, still bearing in mind all the other complexities. Little things like trying to remove stairs because stairs are just like a, a mental burden. If you want to go up and check something very often, try and keep it on the same level. And in general, create a culture of treating the boot wearers with respect in our design. All of this then has to be integrated with all those other obvious design engineering imperatives that contribute to a successful plant project. And this just adds to the challenge because it's the simplest thing to do to lay it out in a linear um, following of the, the, of the process or just follow the hydraulic grade line or, or uh, get the cut and fill of material balance right. But now you have to build all these things in together and bring that change, challenge all together in an integrated fashion. And I'd like to suggest that we can do it too with a little bit of beauty and color. Like this um, Van Gogh called the Red Vineyard that shows again the harvesters bent down in their busyness but there's a happy aspect to their work with a beautiful sun of hope rising in the background and still keep it cheap. So now this, you might wonder what this is. This is a plan drawing of some silos. And our challenge with accomplishing all these things I've just suggested is that we find ourselves here in these silos. And um, they are regular, one, you know, um, symmetrical, sturdy, good concrete structures. The stuff that engineers really like, relative, relatively risk-free, but they don't really capture your imagination looking at that. 
certainly not for someone who isn't used to studying 2D drawings of those kinds of structures. And if I share my journey, I'm in one of these. They're in my little silo. And it's my happy place. My happy place is in my silo, surrounded by all sorts of process engineering textbooks and journals. That's where I love to be. You might have come into my office and find me sometimes like that. All scattered around trying to find out how to optimize or design some treatment process as best as I can. And my mechanical engineering friend is over there in electrical and control and geotech and roads and drainage and stormwater, all situated in those little silos. And to be honest, I'm quite happy in my silo. And I find it a bit unsettling and frustrating to be I'm challenged by this 3D VR new frontiers business that we are faced with today. But that's a good challenge. That's a good unsettling. And, um, and also by other people challenging me have I thought of other things while I'm ensconced in my little silo. So over the years, I've had to engage with more and more disciplines as we grow in our designing of treatment plants. A personal journey was in one of the three heritage firms that formed Oricon, I was basically Manalian. I was the only one in treatment. Hendrik, I think you were pretty much the same where you came from. There wasn't a team, a treatment team. And so we did everything ourselves. I even wrote electrical documents before. Our electrical engineers would be horrified to see that. So it was all fine. You just did everything yourself. But we wouldn't be able to achieve the massive projects that we do now. We wouldn't be able to achieve them with the efficiencies. And I don't think with the thrill that we, have, that, that we have working as a team together now. So this has been quite a journey for me to learn to get out of my, my little silo and that other people and the other ones can do their jobs better than I could possibly. So let's just have a look at that same view of the silos. But now, seeing as we're talking about art, you might have guessed that that's in fact a silo facility at the Cape Town waterfront, which has now been pretty radically modified and given new life as the Zietz Museum of Contemporary Art. It's still silos, but now with some panache. Beautiful picture with the table mountain in the background. From the outside, the silos have the independent function, but they still support each other and the whole building. But if you haven't seen the building, you can't quite imagine what it's like inside where one silo meets another. It's only where we explore the 3D in, uh, impacts of opening those silos up, of slicing and combining them. Only then do we see what the inspirational outcome is that can be achieved. At the center, where those silos relate to each other, that's where people get to experience the real magic. So I'm using these silos to help my discussion in two ways. One is a metaphor for all those technical disciplines um, that are relevant in the design of municipal or other infrastructure and particularly in treatment. Each one trying to optimize their own constraints in their silo and then how we engage those together. But also that a three-dimensional three under understanding of infrastructure helps people to imagine the experience of being within a certain space and to imagine the opportunities that can be created and the difficulties that can be overcome. So the question is, can 3D modeling actually help? And I've, I've genuinely wrestled with this question. Can it enhance the interaction of the multidisciplinary design teams and assist them to arrive at a better solution more efficiently? all the while keeping that human-centric approach in focus. So some years ago, I was asked, well, I had to make the decision whether we would move to this 3D and on a big and high-pressure project. And we decided to do it, but to be truthful, I didn't know what I was getting myself in for. And we got some pretty pictures at the end. It was quite impressive. But we hadn't been react interacting together in any real special way. In fact, our process was quite clumsy, and we ended up having to redraw a lot of the things so that we could get back to doing the proper engineering job. So it was mostly just pretty pictures. We hadn't collaborated in a way 
that, that those models would actually help us in our design. But it's been a journey and by being forced to interact with each other using this 3D environment, all contributing to the design in one virtual space, we've had to understand each other's needs and objectives and strengths and weaknesses better. And I think there's a gradual changing of the answer to those questions from no to yes. I don't think we're fully there yet. There's much, there's much to do and that's where all of you come in. So just touching on the project that Dan introduced us to, the, the Coca Cup uh, project. So this is the Algoa Bay, Port Elizabeth area. And uh, they've, they've faced some, some serious droughts that have left their surface water, um, they, they're dependent on dams. They've left those dams scarily low at some times. And um, there's been growth in the city on top of it. And they've looked at emergency plans for desalination, water reuse, and various things, most of which are quite expensive. But there's a promising source, which is this aquifer, which comes, which is replenished from the Hrut Winterhook Mountains, flows underground through a series of faults, and eventually comes out into the sea. There's actually stories of ancient mariners coming into the bay and scooping fresh water out of the sea, dropping buckets over the sides of, of the boats to um, stock up their fresh water supplies. This, this area where it comes out at is called the mother well area, as in the mother of all wells. So it's a huge water source. And um, there's somewhere between 15 and 20 megalitres per day of replenishable water that's not influenced by drought, good quality, and, it, and can be sourced at a significantly less cost than the alternatives. And at the moment, it just is flowing into the sea. So here's a few pictures of, of the guys striking into, those, into the aquifer, into artesian pressure um, uh, uh, groundwater. They, they, they are getting into that water a couple of hundred meters underground. Um, and the complexities that we faced on the project are, are, are like a normal project, quite manifold. Um, they, the, the wells start off artesian, but eventually the pressure will be lowered and then you get to a place where it's, where it's sustainable and then you have to pump it up. So you need to be able to design a system that can deal with those variations in pressure and, and the various boreholes will, will um, be under different pressures and give different yields. So the, the pumping is, is quite a, a challenge to begin with um, and the management of the pressure and the flow. The environmental challenges in that area were significant. Just um, um, the process of drilling these exploratory holes, which is what these were, was a challenge because the environmental authorities didn't want the water to run, run down. Um, but you needed to test the boreholes to see what the yields were. And they wouldn't allow that because of the iron and manganese that was in the water. Um, the water quality itself, very rich in iron and manganese, that's a, a challenge. The type of treatment that needed to be used, we Dan touched on that. And for now, safe to say, it in itself is a novel process, the, the decision to use biofiltration. And um, this is where I get excited in my little silo. And we have, we have, um, had some pretty special experiences with this process before. Um, it's more cost effective, operationally more reliable, and um, it's completely outperformed our expectations in the, in the loads of iron and manganese that can be removed versus what we expected and what's been observed elsewhere in the world. Other issues we battled with were power supply to the site. It's a very remote site. There's very significant security concerns, and we had to keep those in mind all the time for how the, the operators would be looked after. Health and safety, process control, and of course our human-centric design. Just some of the things that we need to do. So the team that worked on the um, project was, was a team of mainly engineers below the age of 35, all at or just about to get their, their professional registration. They'd worked on some significant treatment projects, um, enough to have gained some valuable expertise and also to have been frustrated a few times in their little silos. And a few of them had a core and deep appreciation of this particular client and their staff and their preferences, which was important because it's a good client. So they set some simple ground rules 
all disciplines are equal. They accepted and embraced iterative work. They said there is going to be a time where we almost frustrate each other. That's going to happen, but there'll be some ground rules about that. They acknowledged that there would need to be continued input from all disciplines throughout, not just leaving some right to the end, with structured output, and that there would be frequent engagement through, through structured design workshops. So there are different ways of doing this, and this team came up with their method of, of how to handle that. Part of what they came up with was this very precise, detailed process flow diagram, which the hub of is called the mess, and it's affectionately called the mess. And um, this, this is how they, they planned the work, noting that there would be this iterative process where there was backwards and forwards and, and depending on each other and, and reiterating designs as, as the design detail was unfolded. But they agreed first what needed to be established before they went into that mess, what would be the accomplished in it, and when they would come out. They said deadlines for each other, when they come out of that, and what they would come out with. And it seems to have been really helpful because everybody affectionately turns, refers to the mess and all the things that they need to accomplish before and after that. My brief to them was to remember the human-centric approach, that it would be non-negotiable, to keep in mind the end users of that infrastructure and what they need to do their jobs, to look at the logical monitoring routes and the rounds and the operation protocols, and to focus on a compact layout, easy circulation, and visibility of all the process elements and machinery. And ironically, the health and safety was quite a driver for that as well, to look after those people. One of the unique things that our team has done is interacted with, um, with the local municipal WhatsApp group um, of process controllers and got on that group and got input from them. And uh, Moses sitting here was the one who initiated that. And um, th their response in receiving our interest has been, been quite amazing. Um, and then one other thing that they did was to, in the design, was to deliberately question the class distinctions between so-called blue-collar and white-collar workers on the, on the treatment plants and, try and, and to try and break down those barriers. A fun key moment in, the, in that design process was this building block session where they literally had foam and Lego and little, little men and tried to piece together what the plant would look like. To get to that point, each discipline had to have done quite a lot of foundational work in their silo. They had to know the basic sizing, the key design constraints. What were you worried about in your design? Enough to enable a team to come together and collaborate together to form a concept of what that plant would look like. Taking into account all of these types of items, all those silo issues. The, the little model at the end, little cardboard boxes, was then drawn up in a, in a very quick and easy SketchUp model, which is something I think as we moved on in our journey, we would probably not even do that anymore. We would take that straight into a more formal 3D modeling process. But as I say, this was a journey and all time learning to be more efficient. Um, and from there, we took it into a formal 3D modeling package, in our case, Revit where the model was developed in detail in the mess. There was simul simultaneous collaboration on that 3D model from all the interacting disciplines from that last chart and um, with, with, with simultaneous access. Things like pipework, cabling, dosing pipework, architecture, structures, the mechanical equipment, all at the same time. And of course the devil is in the details with this and they needed to continually interact and have collaborative agreement on how to build that model architecture, the libraries, the objects, and so on. How to, how to build up the actual building blocks and have, have discussions on lessons learned and how to improve document control and object libraries and those sorts of things. Weekly, the team would ex export this to a cloud-based viewer so that there could be global real-time access by all the engineers. And then they would have momentary freezes for for checks 
and for measuring and, and other requirements. So what did it help with? Well, it assisted with the 3D visualization being more um, tangible and readable to, to others in the team who were maybe not so spatially involved in, in understanding what this whole structure was about. It, is, it, assisted, it assisted in understanding access and safety, in, re, in routing of minor things. So the big pipe work was obvious, but what about the minor pipe work and dosing pipe work and cabling and so on? It helps a lot with that. It helped with clash detection and snagging. And it really helped to refine the understanding of access, of light, of the sense of place, of, of the human element to the design. And it helps with refining the design to reduce issues that are normally only picked up during construction, which lead to, to construction delays and claims and variations. And finally, I think it gave us more con com confidence in our detailed design stage estimate. So the project then extended that to virtual reality, which for a simple engineer like me is a little bit like a gaming platform and it takes that to that. So this is a, a view of the plant at the upper filter gallery. And um, You'll notice the control room in the background and, and what looks simple, but it's essentially the main process units in the foreground. And that requirement for being drawn into the plant of, of compactness, of access, you can see is happening there. And with this, with this VR modeling now, the elements of lighting and textures and feel are all much more tangible to everybody who views it. Here's a few more um, slides that's looking out the other way around from the operator's control room. To their right would be the laboratory, which is a place that has to be very close, looking out over, over the process that they're con concerned about and right through to the background into the machine room. Just outside the door is an open plan canteen, so, which I think we'll have a view of now. That's the auxiliary equipment machine room which you can see relates into the process area in the background on all three of the main levels. We were able to, to look very carefully at the dismantling and maintenance requirements uh, uh, with this model. This is the service gallery, which again can be messy. A lot of plants you go to, that's a messy, um, dirty, ugly area. But a lot of effort was gone into this to make sure that that's going to be clean. That's a place where you go and do a lot of sampling. Um, and, and that, that that's uh, designed properly. All of this helped with making sure that the design is modular and cost effective and um, that the structural design can be re repeated in elements. This is the, um, the limestone stabilization area. Looks big with a lot of space, but that's because there's space allowed for storage of all the limestone. The plant was designed deliberately with Without the use of lime powder, so there's no dust nuisance on the plant, and without the use of gaseous uh, oxidants. And then, of course, a canteen area. You can't quite see the kitchen area that's off to the side of that. Uh, a meeting and training room in the background, and that's deliberately made as a hub in the middle of, of the laboratory, the control room, and the main process areas. And there's how it looks like from the outside without the 3D terrain shown. Um, and so where does it leave us? As Dan said, we start construction hopefully in a few months and the proof of the pudding will be in that eating. And, and we will see how well this helps the contractor. Um, but already the indications that, that that does. How does the 3D and the VR space help us to do a better job? and to serve our client better. I've highlighted a few points already, but a few others are, it seems to force our team and our disciplines to engage together more than might otherwise happen. And maybe we're getting a little bit closer to that beautiful space that happens when the silos are opened up underneath. The design can be imagined and refined in more detail, which is helpful. It saves problems later. But really importantly, 
it allows all the stakeholders to visualize the project, the plant, before it's constructed and to get a sense of ownership in it. So we found this tremendously valuable for our client. The sense of excitement that the client had in this project and the ownership of it when it was still just on paper um, was quite significant. And that went on to the, those who are responsible for funding the project, for writing the check, um, for the future operators or current operators who have input into it, for the planners in their team and for maintenance staff, all of them. Create, it created a sense of, of, of real excitement about the project for this. So there's, for your client to have ownership of it in advance, that was something quite new uh, for us in that. It allows for training of operators in advance. So there's intention that this will be used for that purpose. And then another very important one is I think um, that the young engineers get quite excited about this. So I still think back in 2D, in the 2D space. And, and that's a skill that we never must learn, must lose. It's, it's, it's essential. But this is something new. And the fact that the young engineers are excited about it, I think is a good thing because we need to be excited about our work. So back to the boots again. One other thing that we can do is we can put ourselves in those boots, in the boots of the operator with greater effect. And we can even off invite those operators in to put those boots on with us in the virtual model and test it to see if we're getting it right before it's built. And lastly, if it's the client we're here, but I will say it anyway, I would like to thank them for the exciting opportunity for working on this project. It's a really good client. And what I love about them is they care about the work. They care about the plants and they care about the service they provide. So that always makes it thrilling to work with a client like that. But then my team and those of you here who worked on the team, on, on the project and others, I just love going to work with you every day and going on this journey as we learn to do things better and take in new technology and learn how to work with it. So thank you and keep putting yourselves in those boots.